I'm excited about this season that we're in as a church. And last, last week we kicked off Focus 21. And uh, the title of last week's message was Time to Focus. Everybody say Time to Focus. Time to Focus. And this week I want to talk to you for a few moments on this thought. Can you see clearly? Can you see clearly? Just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, how clearly can you see? <laughs> can you see clearly? <laughs> As I was preparing for this, this message, I was, I was re- reminded of a story I heard, heard about a, a couple that had been married for 25 years. Been married for 25 years, and husband and wife, they're standing in the kitchen just having a conversation, and he reaches up and takes her glasses off of her face and says, you know, babe, with your glasses off, you look just like the woman I married 25 years ago. And she said, that's funny, because with my glasses off, you look like the man I married 25 years ago. (laughs) For those of you that didn't get that, The more blurry he was, the better he looked. (laughs) Sometimes we feel that way, amen? (laughs) So so he never let her put her glasses on again, no. Can you see clearly? This morning we're going to be talking about not only natural sight, but our spiritual eyes. And we're going to go into scripture in in the book of Mark where Jesus addresses this very thing. If you were here last Sunday, um, you know that I gave you seven, seven words that the Lord just placed in my spirit going into this 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I, I said some of you may want to pray these, uh, take one a day and pray, pray on them uh, for one another or for yourself. Um, maybe they were just declarations in your life that you just said, yes, I received that. The seven things were breakthrough. We believe that we're going to see breakthrough in the lives of people, miracles. How many of you know that our God is still in the miracle-working business? Amen. He's not dead. He's still alive. His word's still alive, so that means he still works miracles. We also talked about purpose, that, that during, as we consecrate ourselves unto the Lord, that purpose is often defined because you're clearing the clutter out of, out of your life and you're focusing on him, and all of a sudden, per, fresh purpose is is defined in our life. Also, we, uh, that, that we believe that we were going to see restoration, restoration in families and in marriages and between sons and, da- and daughters and, and fathers and mothers and, and see families restored and people restored and relationships restored. Restoration. Somebody say restoration. We serve the God that makes all things new. It says, behold, all things are passed away. All things are being made new. Isaiah declared it prophesied it, that behold, God says, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. Somebody say new thing. We serve a restoring God. We also said that during this time, we'll come into kingdom alignment, aligning with his will, that our our prayer would be like Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done, that that it'd be his will that we're after in our our life, that through, through that, through that kingdom alignment, that kingdom connections would take place. And then all that happens so that his kingdom can be advanced. Because when we are about advancing his kingdom, the church grows. The church grows. We were, um, we, we were in a conversation before, before, before service uh, t- today, and one of the gentlemen that we were talking with, he told my mother and father-in-law, he said that, that he had been in this church his, his whole life. It's the only church he's ever been to. And somebody said, well, you were at the other building. And he says, yeah, I was in different buildings, but I was in the same church. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm the church. We are the church. And so as as his kingdom is advanced, the church grows. The result of that is people get saved, people get delivered, miracles take place, people come into the house of the Lord, they're discipled, and then they go out and reproduce as well. Amen? So we serve the God that's still in the miracle working business. Some of you that I had contact with throughout throughout the week, I told you about a friend of mine that... um, his, his two-and-a-half-year-old son underwent a major brain operation, uh, removing a brain tumor from the top of his brain um, just about a week ago. And he called out for prayer warriors. If you're here on Wednesday night, you may have heard this. But 
um, they, they went into this surgery and, and they said that there was, the doctor said that there was three things that could happen during this operation. One is it, it, it could affect his vision. He could be blind for the rest of his life. Number two, it could erase his memory, that he, he would not be able to remember anybody, nothing. And then the third one was that it would mess up his hormones and that for the rest of his life he'd have to be on hormone medication as a two-and-a-half-year-old baby. We came in here Wednesday night because the, he went through a, an operation that started at 11 in the morning. He got out at 7 at night. And, and I was excited because people were praying literally all over, the, all over the world for this little baby. The church as a whole was praying for this baby. And, and short time after he came out of surgery, this two-and-a-half-year-old opened his eyes. He remembered his mom and dad, and he could see them clearly. He even remembered his favorite blankie. Amen. But they were still concerned. Amen. They were still concerned because, because the doctor said, but... The hormone situation is almost, it's going, it's going to happen. And your son will be on hormone medication the rest of his life. Yesterday, somebody say yesterday. I received a message that said, keep standing with us because the doctor came in and said, I don't want you to get your hopes up. I don't want you to get your hopes up, but according to the latest tests that we ran, it appears as though your son will never have to take medication for his hormones. Can somebody give the Lord praise in this house? I still serve the God that's in the miracle working business. We were fellowshipping a few moments ago. If you were, again, if you were here Wednesday night, we were praying for... Um, Brother Lowell and Sister Sarah Allison's uh, daughter-in-law, Brandy, because they found her unresponsive. They just told me that she came home, and they still don't know what happened, but she's home, she's functioning, and she's doing well. How many of you know we serve a God that's in the miracle-working business? And so this morning, we're going to look at Scripture, and we're going to look in Mark chapter number 8. We're going to begin with verse 22, where we see Jesus performs a crazy miracle in the life of a blind man. If you didn't bring your Bibles, you can follow along with me on, on the screen. I'll be reading out the New Living Translation this morning. And we're going to pick up with verse 22. The Word of God says, When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus. And they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then, spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything right now? Can you see anything now? Another translation is where, I believe it's the New King James Version, that says, Can you see clearly? That's where I got the title from. Can you see anything now? Can you see clearly? The man looked around. Yes, he said. I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. How many of you know that's not natural? If you've ever seen a tree walk through your front yard, we have a special ministry for you. <laughs> then, somebody say then. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were open, his sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away, saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Don't go back into the village on your way home. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. So Mark chapter 8 is an is a interesting um, chapter in the Bible. Because right here we see this crazy miracle that Mark takes a few verses to tell us some specifics on how Jesus performed this miracle. There was a necessity for this miracle to take place on multiple levels. Somebody say it was important. This was very important because just before this miracle, Jesus is rebuking the disciples for their lack of understanding. 
If you look in Mark chapter 8, back around verses, four, around verses 14, 15, 16, right there, he looks at the disciples and say, do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Because they were seeing him as Christ. They were seeing him as Christ, but Jesus was trying to get these disciples to understand, I am the Christ, but I'm not the Christ of your expectations. What I'm about to do far exceeds what you can see in the natural eye. They were seeing Jesus heal people and do crazy signs, wonders, and miracles. But he knew that his ultimate purpose was to do something that no man had ever done before and will never have to do again. They saw him as the Christ, but he said, it's not of your expectations, not of what you see. So he's trying to get them to see through spiritual eyes, and then all of a sudden, Jesus runs into this blind man. He performs this miracle, and then verse 27, if you were conti would continue to read, verses 27, 28, 29, that's where, G that's where Jesus looks at the disciples and, and says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ. So it's an interesting part for this ridiculous kind of miracle to take place. There's some specific things that Jesus did in this moment because, again, he was trying to get the disciples to see something that they couldn't see at that moment in time. Sounds like us so often. We put so many limitations on our Savior. We put so many limitations on the power of his spirit. We put so many limitations because somewhere through life we develop, even though we're, we're, we're full of faith and we believe he can save us, but we don't believe he can heal us. We believe that he can provide salvation for our soul, but he can't restore our marriages. We believe that, that he can heal a blind man in the Bible, and in the scriptures that we read, but he can't provide for us a job. We believe that he can call Peter out to walk on water, but he'll let us down when we respond in faith. It's amazing how so often we know so much, but we have such little faith. We have such little faith. In this 21 days of prayer and fasting, for some of you, it's going to be a faith boost in your life again. Because you're actually going to pound on the gates of heaven and see God show up on your behalf, and it's going to be a revelation of you are still there. Because we get so caught up in routine, we get so caught up in the motions, well, I read my Bible this morning. I said my now laid me down to sleep before I went to bed. So I'm a person of faith. But when's the last time we actually saw miracles take place? When's the last time we actually saw breakthrough show up on the scene? Sometimes we look at people and say, well, they're a little radical. You don't know what they've been through to get radical. You don't know what they've walked through. It could be that they actually applied scriptures to their life. And so therefore there's no denying the existence of their God in their life because they've tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord. So we see that Jesus is trying to reveal to these, to the disciples that you have eyes, but you're really not seeing the whole picture. And so there, there's four things that I want to give you really quick that, that, that we find that Jesus did that some make sense, others might not make sense to us. The first one is, and it's very simple, is this blind man, it says that he was brought to Jesus by some people. So, he, so this blind man was led to Jesus. He was brought to Jesus. The blind man was brought to Jesus. You say, Pastor, that's pretty simple. But the thing I love about that is you hear me 
speak often about not only our vertical relationship, but also our horizontal relationships. This is partnership in action. This is some people that said, this man has a great need, and I'm going to take him to the one that can meet the need. The, the, the interesting thing is that they brought him to Jesus, expecting Jesus to do something right there on the spot. We're later going to find out, and as we read the scripture, that's not exactly how it played out. It's that ability to connect horizontally with one another. The reason I, I have us so often join hands in prayer, and I pray over you as a congregation, and encourage you to pray for the one on the right and on the left of you, because that's what the, the, Jesus said the greatest command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, but also love your neighbor as yourself. I believe that we see all throughout the word of God what you make happen for somebody else, God will make happen for you. And when you can partner your faith with somebody else and you can pray and believe with them, there's something supernatural that takes place in the heavenlies that we don't always see, but there's a, there's a powerful moment that takes place because it's partnership. It's kind of like, you know, that old song we used to sing, lean on me when you're not strong, I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. Y'all like that, don't you? So, I ain't going to sing it to you. But we always need somebody to lean on. There, there are times, there are times, our, our responsibility as believers, that when another believer is down, we got to bring them back to Jesus. God didn't call us to be the gossip partner on the end of the line. God didn't call us to be the discourager in their life. Our responsibility is to bring them back to where we know they can get what they need. So we find this right here again in Scripture. I just wanted to point that out, that he was brought to Jesus. Couldn't get there himself. He was brought. Somebody say he was brought. Then the second thing we find is that not only was he brought to Jesus, but then he himself was led by Jesus. Now, again, Jesus could have healed him right there on the spot. Jesus could have reached down, touched him right there, went on about his way, and called it a day. But as I like to say, you can't re read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. You have to dig in a little bit. He was in a place called Bethsaida. The under thing you got to understand is that was a place that if you refer back to Matthew chapter 11, around verse 21, you'll find that Jesus cursed that place. He was in the city that Jesus cursed. He was in a cursed place. He was, he was in a place, and well, well, why would Jesus curse that place? When you read, Matthew tells, tells a good depiction of it by, by, in Matthew 11, because Jesus says, hey, I performed two crazy signs and wonders, miracles, here in this place, one of them being this blind man, but yet you as a town still don't believe in my teachings. You still won't follow me. He said, if I would have done this in some other places, they would be following me. But you, even though you've seen the miracles take place, you still refuse to believe. This man was brought to Jesus in that place. And so Jesus did not choose to heal him there. Jesus had to lead him out of the cursed place. You see, again, he was the Christ. They, they understood he was the Christ. But their expectations was limited perspective of who he truly was. And so he moved this man out of the city limits because it, there was a trust factor that was being developed. Listen, when you go on a journey with Jesus, and some of us know this to be true, there's a trust that has to come along in that relationship. Faith, trust, whatever you want to call it. But as this man began to walk with Jesus, it was as though he was building trust with every single step. What happens so often is we're taught, but we don't always trust. We're taught so often, but we don't always trust. And that's what I said a few moments ago about how we don't always believe that Jesus can still perform the signs, wonders, and miracles that we see throughout the Bible. But what I believe was happening was this, that as this man was being led by Jesus, every step he took away from the place of familiar, his trust was being developed in his, in his Savior. 
As we go on a journey with Jesus, I, I, I promise you, he will want to break you out of familiar comfort zones in our life. That's the reason I've called us as a corporate body, body to this time of prayer and fasting because it, what we're doing is we're breaking away from our comfort stuff. We search Facebook for the word before we search the word for the word. We're so built up on stale manner, re, reproduced from somebody else that we fail to go to the fresh manna. The amazing thing I love about this word, and you've probably heard me say it before, is simply this, that I can read the same scripture a hundred times, and there's still life that comes out of it. We love, to, we love to preach about this blind man that Jesus spit in his face, and his eyes opened up, and that sounds good, and that makes us shout, and that makes us rejoice, but we don't understand all the steps and the necessity of it, and, and it's that that will actually build our faith. Because, again, Jesus is looking at these disciples and he's saying, yeah, you don't see everything clearly. My question to you this morning, Heritage, is simply this. Are you seeing Jesus clearly in your life? Are you, or, or do you have a limited perspective of who he is? Do you believe that he was able to bring um, Paul and Silas out of a midnight prison but can't show up in your dark hour? I love Genesis 1.1. For in, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. It was without void. But his spirit. His spirit hovered there. His spirit was moving in the dark places. We're like, man, that's good, but I'm in a dark moment in my life. Where are you, God? His spirit is still hovering and moving. With every step, this man that this man was taken with Jesus, he was breaking and leaving the familiar. He was leaving the familiar. I was teaching Lexi how to swim. Lexi's our, our, our three-year-old. And as I was, when I was teaching her to swim about a year and a half ago, we were breaking her away from the, the floaties, and I, I took her swimmers off her arms, and I just threw her out there in the pool. That's a joke. But I took her and I started at the steps and I held her hand. And then we would step down a little more. And, you know, it's below my knees, but it's about up to here on her. And then we get a little deeper and a little deeper. And she's okay as long as there's ground there for her to stand on. But the deeper we went, the, the farther she would climb up daddy. And the tighter her grasp would come to me, and when I was up to about here on me, she was strangling me because she was choking me so tight because she couldn't touch the ground anymore. But she had enough trust in her father that even though she couldn't stand, that he would not allow her to drown. You see, this, this instinct is, is in us as a child. This instinct is already there for us to latch on to something that we trust and we have faith in. But the problem is, we so often will do that with people around us, but we won't do that with our Heavenly Father that promised, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I love my children with all my heart. My intent is life, and life is to never let them down or never hurt them. But the reality is, I'm human. Some point in time, my, 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 my daughter will be upset with me. <laughs> she doesn't want anything to do with me when Nani and Poppy's around. You know, nothing. So, so next week, when they leave, we'll have to be retraining our children. But that's in us. And how much is that what we're supposed to be like? And that's what this blind man was doing. I believe that as he was walking with Jesus, he was breaking away from the familiar. 
He was going on a journey he had never been before because Jesus, as you read the scripture, he takes him outside of the city limits. He takes him from that cursed place, breaks him out of the familiar. But then we find that Jesus does something pretty crazy. He spits in the guy's face. He spits in his eyes. This is Jesus. A simple touch would have done the job. A simple spoken word would have done the job. A a simple little hug could have opened the blind man's eyes. A simple declaration from the blind man could have popped his eyes open. But Jesus chose to spit in his face. I said, why? Why? But Jesus does it. He spits in his face. But you know what? I thought of in reading this and, and, do it, and studying the backstory on it. What I, what, Jesus was not happy with the situation the guy was in. He wasn't happy with the city that he was in. I can go to Revelation 3.16 that reminds me that he would rather us be hot or cold because we're lukewarm. He'll spit us out of his mouth. It's as though he spits on things he doesn't like. That's, just bear with me a minute. You say, but why would he spit? You saying he don't like the guy? No, he didn't like the blindness. But what he didn't like even more than that was the spiritual blindness of the disciples that have seen him do such crazy miracles along the journey, along the walk, and throughout, throughout the path, but yet they were still just focused on one part of him. The other reason is simply this. Jesus doesn't always perform miracles the way we want him to. Sometimes he'll do something ridiculous that makes no sense because I believe he always wants to blow our mind. Again, we we go back to, to, to Ephesians. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we may ever ask or think. He's able to blow our mind. Look at your neighbor and say, he can blow your mind. And I believe that what Jesus was doing here, he was performing a miracle like he hadn't before, so he was going to do something that really got these guys' attention, so he spits in the guy's face. Listen, we cannot limit our Savior. We cannot limit our healer. We cannot limit the one that has the ability to bring breakthrough in our life, because when we are open to him and we say we present our need to him, what our job is to do is to say, however you choose to perform the miracle, I'll trust you. Is there anybody in here that wants to have that type of faith in your Savior? Because I believe that what limits us so often is our own lack of trust and faith in who he is. And we want to say, we want you to do it like we want it done. We want it done on our timetable. We want to do it in our comfort zone. We want to stay right here in the familiar. And this is how we expect it to happen, Jesus. And if you don't do it that way, it's the devil. I know you were expecting something better there. But so often we're rebuking the devil, and he ain't buking. And there's a good chance he's innocent of all charges. That's good. We give him too much credit sometimes. It's Jesus trying to do something different like we've never seen before so that our faith can continue to be be revealed and our faith can be continue to advance and our trust in him can continue to, to develop because his desire is that he takes us from glory to glory to glory to glory, that he's an ever-increasing God. He never wants us to stay in the same stagnant places that we're in in life. He never wants us to stay so comfortable in our familiar that we lose our faith in him. And he's saying, I'm just trying to stretch you. I'm just trying to reveal myself fresh to you again. I don't know about you, but that's the Jesus I want to be in relationship with. I, 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 love, I'm, I, love, I love to shout. I love to clap. I love it. I love energy. Those of you that have been around me, you, you, you're learning. I don't, I don't, I don't sit still. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm energetic. I'm, I, I, I can't. Not even on medication, I can't. <laughs> but, but, 
the most awesome places with God is when he takes your breath away. Where you, you, you can't speak in tongues, you can't say anything, you can't do nothing. It's as though he's just taking your breath away. I believe this was a take my breath away moment for these disciples. I believe this was a moment where they were, is this really happening? I think Peter was about ready to fight because he's like, if this dude's eyes open, he's going to punch Jesus because he's spit in his face. I, you're not going to find that in there, but I'm just saying. I, th I, th I think Peter was like, on, on, but it was this, <gasps> what's going to happen now? I have a sensing in my spirit. I have a sensing in my spirit. And this wasn't in the notes, so this is free for whoever wants it. I believe God is positioning us for a take my breath away moment. I believe God is orchestrating some things that when we get through this season, we're going to look back and say, I don't know how that even happened. There are people of faith in this house. I've seen God do some amazing things. I've seen it happen. I've seen God do amazing things. I've seen God bring streams of water in the wilderness. I've, I've seen God do supernatural healings. But I never want to be at the place that I limit God to a past experience. I believe that some of you, it may be getting tough in this fast. It, it, you might be hitting some tough places. Don't give up. I believe we're approaching a take my breath away moment. And you can read my notes after service. That's not in there. But I sense that in this atmosphere this morning. Jesus spits on him. You have to remember that Jesus was trying to teach the disciples that you can have eyes and you can see in the natural. You can see in the natural things taking place. But he's a supernatural God. He's a supernatural God. Which means, Austin, if we can see him do it, he can far exceed it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. That if we can dream it, he can exceed it beyond what we could ever imagine or think. So let me encourage you by saying this. Whatever it is that is pressing against you, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that's pushing against you in your life, in your house, whatever it is that's caused you to lose doubt and have doubt if God can even do it again, let me remind you that he is able. It's not about what you've seen in the natural. It's about what he's going to do in the supernatural. And so he's doing this in a crazy way taking steps that he normally wouldn't take because it wasn't so much about the blind eyes being opened as it was about the spiritual eyes being revealed to his true glory. And what I believe is this. We don't seek after miracles just because it makes us feel good. We seek after miracles because, it, again, it's another opportunity for Jesus to do what only he can do. I love it when doctors show up and say, don't get your hopes up. Because my hope is going to another level because I don't hope in man's system. I hope in the report of the Lord. I hope in the goodness of my Savior. I hope in what he has the ability to do, not what man has the ability to do. I'm not against doctors. I'm looking for a good one now, so if anybody has any options, give it to me. But I believe God uses doctors. Luke was a doctor. I believe he works through man. I believe he gives the knowledge. I believe he gives the increase. I believe we should study and show ourselves approved. I believe we should be educated. I believe all of that, but I also believe that there comes a time that we got to get our hands off of it and say, here I am, Lord. You're going to have to blow my mind in this situation because it's out of my human capability. So we find, moving into the last point, that when Jesus spit on him, there was multiple reasons. He was doing it in a way that just totally didn't make sense because he was trying to prove a point. And then we find that the last point is this, that this blind man was touched by Jesus. 
He was touched by Jesus. Jesus asked him a question. So he spits in his face. He asks him a question. He says, can you see clearly? Do you see anything now? And the man responds with, I, I, I do. I see men as trees walking. I see people, but they look like trees and they're walking around. And even the disciple says, that's crazy. That's not natural. So then, the story reads that then Jesus touched him. Then Jesus touched him. Jesus doesn't have to do a two-part miracle. Jesus can be a one-touch and everything is healed, God. But in this situation, he was drawing the parallel to where the disciples were. The same thing he asked them back in verse 14. Do you have eyes but can't see? Hey, blind man, what, can you see clearly now? Oh, I, I, I see. I see. But what I see is people that look like trees moving around. The disciple says, that's not right. And I believe probably Mark just skipped out a couple words that may have been exchanged there where Jesus says, that's what I'm trying to show you guys. Because that's you right now. Remember when I asked you, do you have eyes but you can't see? You say, yeah, 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 I can see. No, you don't see. I believe he touched that blind man and his eyes opened up. Then he turned and looked at the disciples and now your eyes are about to be open. I believe there's a few things that transpired in that moment. But what I felt in my spirit and the reason I put this point in there was for this. I believe that we as believers so often walk away from Jesus before he's through performing the miracle. We settle, Bishop Wayne, we settle for blurred vision. We settle in our life for blurred vision of who he is. I know he died for me. I know he saved me. But I'm just not sure about everything else. And I believe that what God is doing in us as a church family is he's opening our eyes again. I'm talking about me as your pastor. I didn't come to Oak Ridge for God to do in me what he did last year. I came here believing that God was about to do something new. I believe that God was about to take me to a place he's never taken me. I believe that God is about to do something in my family that he's never done before. I don't come here to regurgitate a past season experience. I come here to say you brought me to a new season. And you're the God that's waiting in that season for me. And I believe that's what he wants to do in your life. I didn't do a 21-day fast because it's a fad that's going on around churches. And so we can get on Facebook and say, look at us, we're fasting. I did it because I want this experience that Jesus took these disciples through where he says, what do you see? And I want him to clear up the vision of simply who he is. The amazing thing is this, thing clear. Then he wraps it all up and he says, now go, but don't go back to that town. He was saying, don't go back to the familiar. Don't you get back in there and let them people put that blind label back on you. 
Don't you get back there in that cursed land where you can't produce the testimony of your life. Don't you go back to where I brought you from. I'm ready for Jesus to blow my mind in a way that I never want to go back to the familiar place. I want Jesus to blow your mind in a way that you never fall back into the familiar. There's, there's some wonderful saints in here today been serving God a long time. There's some that's just starting the journey. It doesn't matter where our steps are. It doesn't matter where we're at in the journey. What it matters is God is ready to blow our mind. The question is, can you see clearly? Or do you have a blurred vision of what God is able to do? Here's the dangerous part, is that when God does it, that we fall back to the familiar and say, wasn't that good? His mercies are new every day. He has the ability to far exceed our expectations. We just have to be in a place to receive it. Stand with me if you would.